Diego Kalsa, my Q for that. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Media Watch. I'm your host, Dr. Savi. Every week on Media Watch, we try and bring you some exciting guests, and uh, without doubt, we've got some exciting guests this week. Uh, I'm going to introduce you them in a minute. Uh, but just to remind you about the Media Watch show, the Media Watch show looks at uh, current news. And we also get our inspired guests to tell us a little bit about what is driving them to do what they do so they can inspire you uh, when you actually tune in and uh, uh, listen to all the great ideas that they've got and maybe one day you can give me a shout and then come on the show and tell me about the exciting things that are inspiring you to do your career. Okay, without further ado, let's move on with the show. I'd like to introduce Mamit and Helen Kemp. So, Mamit Chaudhry, Helen Kemp, why you go to Why you there? Lovely to meet you. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you for having us. And we will discuss in a bit what you actually do. I mean, I know you're both directors of uh, an exciting company called Optimum Thinking. Uh, OptimumThinking.net, I think, is the website. Yes. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. But as you know, the first part of the show is always to talk about uh, the news headlines. And there is, unfortunately, a headline that doesn't seem to be going away. And why should it not go away, especially in the context of um, the terrible situation a few weeks ago with Harvey uh, Weinstein, a particular movie producer from Hollywood, uh, had a confession come forward saying that a lot of people uh, were harassed by him. Uh, I've got a definition of what harassment actually is. And it's a lot of courage that people put forward together, whether it be male or female, who uh, bring out into the public gaze the fact that uh, they have suffered uh, and now those particular individuals who did actually carry out that negativity, I would call it, uh, are now uh, moving away from the scene, hiding away. Uh, but I reckon eventually there will be some justice. Obviously, we're not going to comment about those particular cases in detail. Uh, but we can discuss the general subject with regards to, to confidence uh, with the ability to almost like recover from that. Now, recently, a particular minister has resigned, saying that he felt that at that time, that behaviour may have been acceptable, but it may not be acceptable now. I personally was shocked about that particular comment because any behaviour of that time, whether it be in the past or now, is um, totally not justified to do. It's just really, really terrible. So tell us about, I mean, do, do you feel the same way? Do you think, I think what he was implying is that times have changed. I mean, you know, in the workplace where you've worked, you work with a lot of professionals, you're in the corporate space as well, uh, you come across many different cases. Do you think times have changed, or is it always the case that uh, that kind of harassment is, is unacceptable, it's just that people have had enough kind of courage to come forward? I'd say there's no doubt times have changed, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's certainly different, and I think that um, laws are constantly changing as well to um, help people who are, are not as um, empowered in the workplace actually feel that they're going to get support. Um, I guess from the work we do, one thing that came to mind as you, was, you were describing that is that it's very much that if people are playing overdog positions, sooner or later someone's mm. actually going to undermine them and actually get them back down into a balance. And I guess when you push power too far and you get into that position, you're going to be humbled in some way. And um, it's, it went on for so long that a lot of people resigned to avoid um, you know, being in that public space, I guess, when that's happening. I guess they can run, but they can't really hide, because once it comes out, mm. there will be obviously more revelations, and mm. there seems to be some secret list apparently floating around, which won't be secret for much longer, where people are saying they suffered this, or there's a culture of that. I mean, we talk about corporate culture in detail. I mean, it's a very complex place, isn't it? You know, you've got you know, they say that you get two people in a room, you get politics, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. <laughs> obviously, if obviously, if there's a single person they're talking to themselves, it might be a bit crazy. <laughs> yeah. But normally, you, you get that, you know, that kind of um, competitiveness. And there's nothing wrong with that, the competitiveness. But when it becomes, like, backbiting and people are undermining each other or, you know, sycophantic behaviour, you know, you find that people are trying to appease to, to get on. Do you think they do it as a survivalist thing? Do, yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, people are always trying to strive to get what's most important to them. And, um, you know, we're, we're always going to take on what behavior is needed to, dic to get that. Um, you know, we, we're all operating on this kind of what we call, um, you know, master key, which is operating us on a very subconscious level. So, um, you know, a different way of looking at rather than it being instinct is actually, that's my highest priorities. I'm going to take on whatever behavior I need to get that because that's what everybody's committed to. They're not committed to any anything else but fulfilling that, that list of priorities. But is that because sometimes, um, I mean, take an entrepreneur for example who, you know, it would be very difficult to, to kind of strive and survive and expand your organisation and sometimes there's certain entrepreneurs who don't let go, they kind of 
hang on to the business. And there's nothing wrong with that because they, they, they have to build up a level of confidence. But then they not sometimes have to make that leap sometimes to move from a small company to a slightly bigger company and actually let go a little bit and then concentrate more on the strategy stuff. But in the back of their mind, they're thinking, oh, the people that I left behind, are they really able to do this stuff? So there's almost like their baby that, that they've grown and they really need to kind of build some trust with. And then they leave people behind who are fighting with each other. I mean, how, how do you... Do you work on an organisational level? Is that something that can help? Absolutely. Yeah. When people are fighting amongst each other, again, as Mammy said, they're all trying to get what they want. So if they happen to have their um, hierarchy of what's important to them aligned with someone else, whatever's at the top, if that's really matching, they're going to, they're going to be competitive in that space. So conflict will occur there. Wherever someone's highest priorities are challenged is going to create conflict. So the work we do in organisations actually going in and training those people to have a new awareness of how to have a conversation to work through that. So that we can actually still um, value each other for what we're doing. But if you put too many people in a space, and I think um, Parliament is that kind of space where there's super competitive people, then you're going to have that conflict because they're all after power and they, they're going to be clashing at that level. Because but sometimes they say, power. especially in, I mean, the comment that's been made is that there is a culture of that a culture of harassment. I mean, the term harassment, I kind of looked it up. I mean, mm. harassment is defined as any unwanted physical, verbal or non-verbal conduct that has the purpose and effect of violating a person's dignity or creating an intimidating, um, kind of a hostile, degrading, humiliating or kind of a, an offensive situation or, or environment. So effectively, it becomes like a toxic environment, but the only way that anybody can get experience, say for example, you're a researcher, you go to to a particular place and then you have to work with that dynamic don't you and it can really knock your confidence or you play the game I mean how do you get out of that toxic environment how do you get what you want out of it without actually being infected yourself and you and then you almost like mirroring that so the culture that that is there makes you into that kind of you know kind of almost like assimilates you do you think there's a risk of that I think there absolutely is because I think people get sort of, as you said, sucked into what's going on and if they want to be included because they perceive being included is going to help them get what they want, then yes, their behaviour would be very likely to mirror the others around them. I would agree with that 100%. The question you asked just before that was how do you cope with that? You have to actually have um, strength of mind and resilience and a questioning processes to actually be able to step out of yourself and actually go, what's going on? How do I navigate this? We say that person with the most behavioural thinking and flexibility is that, sorry the most um, thinking flexibility is actually con going to control yeah. the game so if you're not actually able to step out of yourself and get that emotional self separate you won't be able to actually balance it easily. But I think sometimes you can be bullied so much though in the workplace or, or even if there's a culture you're at school you're bullied a lot. That, there, there was I was talking about this on a, on a show recently that they reckon that kids recover from it after three years but I, I don't know how they measure that because I still think that even after three years, you know, it, it, there's something that get, gets left behind. You just imagine those actors and actresses who, who've had that, you know, kind of terrible, or the researcher or somebody who worked in Parliament has had that terrible situation with them. They're still almost like they're living with it. How, yeah. how do they break out of that, you know? Um, I think it's, it's just like Helen said, it's that they have the actual tools to process something like that and actually step out of what's going on and be able to, you know, go in and deal with whatever's happening emotionally that will, you know, help them control the game. Um, and when we're saying control the game, it's very much controlling their own life as well. Um, you know, because otherwise you're just going to be staying in very much emotional reactions. And as you said, I'd, I mean, it'd be interesting to see where that research comes from about people, you know, um, like dealing with bullying after three years. But some people hold on to it for years. Um, some people can just deal with it there and then. So it really depends. But, um, you know, going in there and actually helping people um, emotionally dissolve the situation um, helps them get over it. Yeah, and, that, and something can also happen to them. I think um, there's another example, I think, where, where people can... Uh, a, a bad situation, maybe they've lost somebody, you know, uh, I know I've, I've heard you speak about it before actually where, you know, you do recover from that, your own personal situation. You, and, and I was thinking about this actually, that what drives these people, you know, you find these people that are, I don't know if you've heard about in the UK, or I mean you might have heard of it because you're based in the UK and you're based in Australia, but there's been uh, cases where um, you know, there's been almost like predators, you know, uh, going for particular, you know, um, uh, age groups uh, and you think well, is there something bad that happened to you when you were a kid 
that actually now means that your behaviour against women or younger women or the grooming situation is causing you to do that? Or is it just some kind of, you know, bent kind of weird, you know, um, sexual uh, excitement you get out of it, you know? It seems really weird that some of these people behave that way uh, because it might have been their past, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Do you ever find that with some of the work that you do? Yeah, I mean, um, Helen, you can comment too, but I just think that sometimes it really depends on, um, it can be something that, for example, if they've said, you know, if they've experienced it at home and thought, well, I, if my dad treats, you know, my mum like that, then that's fine for me to treat, you know, people like that, then they may, you know, be seeing that behaviour and repeating that. Um, on the other hand, you also have people who want to avoid what kind of, um, you know, background they came from as well. So it's, you know, the work that we do is really very much to see that how whatever's, whatever whatever they're experiencing really um, is just service and, you, you know, we're playing, so the universal laws that we talk about, they're always at play um, and you're just playing a little part in this big matrix and, you know, giving other people what they need and taking what you need from other, what we call agents of the universe. Mm. Do you think there's, um, I mean, there's a lot of writing about visualising, if you can visualise it, you can become it, you know, do you, do you believe in that? Do you think that if you have a positive outlook and, and you keep thinking positively, you're actually going to achieve what you want to achieve? Well, we don't actually condone positive thinking as a, as a sense of that's the books like The heading. Secret yeah. and The Prophecy and that yeah. kind of, those kind of books. So no one's ever prof um, um, <laughs> positive all the time are they would you no, agree not. like, like it's not actually possible so you're chasing a one-sided world so when we say optimum thinking we want to make it really clear we don't mean optimists we, we just couldn't find any other word that better suited what the middle is so we say that actually negative serving uh, negative thinking also serves us because it shows us what we don't want so if we didn't have both positive and negative in our toolkit, we wouldn't actually know what we didn't want and when we did want things. So it's about bringing that back together. So you used the term before like bullying um, and harassment. They're quite big labels. Mm. So we, we would work with clients because everyone is a unique individual. So we have to go in and say, so in that situation, what was really going on for you? So that's how we actually look at how empowering the person according to what's really important to them. So a label like bullying with an education background like I have, um, I find that it's actually, um, it's happened because the, the laws, the man-made laws are actually labeling things just like um, some of the other sciences do. and packing it all in with all the different behaviours and now we've got a label for it, now we can make a law about it. The work we do is we go and work with the individual and say what's important to you at that time in your life, what was the actual event that happened? Because if you just call it bullying, like I've worked with a client that um, said they were bullied and when we went in and looked at it, it wasn't that big a deal but because it fitted under the bracket of bullying, they turned it into a big deal. Um, in their mind because they, they saw themselves as a victim now because I've been bullied. So the work we do is about helping people get out of that victim mentality but they can, we can only do it on a one-on-one -on -one basis with them so that they can actually see how it might have served them in the moment. Um, so certainly that sustained behaviour we don't condone personally <laughs> mm. um, or anything like that but it's actually working with the individual person is the only way you'll see what meaning they made because all the work we're talking about is in, in our mind we're a meaning making machine, we're making meaning about everything that happens to us so if we're making one sided negative meanings all the time then that's actually going to disempower us so our goal is to actually help the person get empowered again what about, if you, if you talk about the agents of change, right? I mean, in an organisation you've got, I mean, say, say, you know, we've got Theresa May saying, you know, we need to have a, a standards committee. And so it's a good thing to say, right? It's a good thing to say there should be a process, there should be a procedure. If there's a problem, you should be able to go independently so that you're not ignored. And if you've got a serious complaint, inverted commas, you know, you can actually get to have all the facts in front of you so that all sides can see that it really is a legitimate thing. I'm not saying that those people that are, uh, have said that there's an issue here, it's, it's not an issue. It's genuinely an issue and they have to come forward with courage and talk about it. But but have the facts open and those that need to be told that this is wrong is based on evidence, right? Um, because there's a, there's a potential for it to be abused, right? And I'm not defending any of the people that have done any of that stuff. I'm just saying the facts are there, there are open. What I worry about is the leadership element, which is to say, in an organisation, so let's take the, comp the situation, you've got an organisation like the House of Commons, like a corporate, right? But the inherent culture, and I've seen it myself in certain companies where I do my consulting, and, and I see that the culture itself is so toxic. You know, it is a whole culture of you do what I tell you, and it's coming from either it's a particular company that happened to have... Uh, 
a family history of that or they're very stressed in terms of the way that you can't fix that but you can in theory get to the individual to recognize it do you would, would one course of action be you're in a toxic environment you've got to get out I'm, I'm generalizing here or is it the fact that there are certain things that you could do to make your life better um, is, is that the way you'd handle it uh, yes, we want to actually help them get it at the emotional state, equilibrated, we call it, like brought back to balance, mm. so they can make an informed, clear-minded decision about whether to stay or go. Right, good point. So it's not an emotional reaction that we can actually get them back so they're making clear-minded action and choices. Mm. Um, and then they can have a look at what they really want, what their highest priorities are, and does it serve them better to stay there being able to cope emotionally with what's going on because if you look at our leaders they the higher up you go in in an area of influence the more um, emotionally uh, more emotional mastery you actually require That's so true. the bigger the game you play the more you need to be able to equilibrate emotion um, so that's really the work that inspires us, is helping people develop the toolkit that you need to be able to do that in challenging situations. So it's not whether you'll be challenged or not, it's not whether you'll get emotional or not, that will happen, but it's how long do you stay emotional and how much does that run you. But so what, what, what happens in a situation, you know, so, so, you, so let's take it out of the corporate context, right? Let's put it into a situation where there's a relationship between a man and a woman, right? Um, and often you find that if it is a really negative situation to the woman, right? You know, we, you know, with Guru Nanak's birthday last week, and one of the great things that he he spoke about a revolutionary, you know, equality, men and women, you know, serve society. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, I always think I hope there will be more places where people could go, maybe uh, funded by uh, some of uh, society or culture, or uh, you know, to say, look, this is a place where you can go, which is a good place for refuse. You know, if, if you are in an abusive relationship or whatever, it's often really difficult to get out of that relationship because it's either the kids that mm. are there that they net they need support or be, need protecting, mm. right? Because of that relationship, um, and it's the money situation as well. Sometimes money mm. is controlled by one party versus the other one, right? And so the vulnerability of that individual and the courage that person needs to have to get out of that relationship, and the mm. same in the workplace, they may think. I might not be able to get a job elsewhere because they haven't got the confidence because it's been so beaten up or genuinely they can't get a job because um, clearly the market is difficult you know it's, it's a difficult market at the moment you know, they can't get a job it's difficult to apply they haven't got time to go and get a job so it's very easy for us to say just walk out the door but sometimes there are other dynamics that stop you from doing that, you know. So, mm. what do you do then? You know. Well, we would never say walk out the door. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's what you were going to say. Yeah, I was literally just going to say, yeah. Yeah, yeah, just gonna gonna say yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, well, we wouldn't say walk out the door. Yeah. I wasn't saying that you would, but mm. I'm just saying generally with the idea. Yeah, yeah just, I mean, just, just I, leave it. You know. No, I think whether it be as you said in a relationship or a workplace, um, BC. Sometimes we judge and think, oh, you know, that relationship's not really good, or we'll say that's that job's not good for you. You should get out. Um, you know, the moment we start to say that to people, what we're doing is we're actually judging them through our lens and we're saying to them, you know, according to us, you should be doing this. The minute you start shooting on other people, um, it's actually you imposing what you think is your priorities. But the, the um, you know, reality of it is nobody's going to leave a job or a relationship until they see in their perception that they have more benefits than drawbacks and staying there. So if a person is in a, um, you know, I think Helen said a great thing about, you know, a, a label and you said toxic, it's about actually, let's just have a look, what are you perceiving is toxic in this, in, in this, um, you know, workplace? Because it could just be that actually, you know what, they say some bad stuff about my family and now it's a toxic, you know, culture, for example. So it's really getting in there, finding out what the issues are, whether it be in a relationship or a workplace, um, and helping them actually get out of that emotional reaction. Once you neutralize perceptions, you're then making a decision whether you should leave the relationship or leave the job or stay um, in either um, you know situation based on um, action and not just emotional reaction. Because I know you know when we get like if we get in very high emotional reaction, we'll just you know walk out the door and then afterwards we'll think, oh, did I do the right thing? But really, when you you know when you take a decision from um, action, um, you know you're going to make the decision whether you perceive it to be right or wrong. It's going to be from more of an open-hearted. Um, I'm going to see that there are equal drawbacks of what decision I do make. And, and sometimes I think it's uh, important, even on both sides, to come together, isn't it? I mean, they 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 talk about that that pounding of two individuals. They pound like this. Uh, and then they say, actually, do you know what, if you stop for a second and you stop pounding and just looked at it from this lang uh, lang angle, mm. you'd say, you know, you're pounding each other here, but 
really these are the important things that are, are common to both of you, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe you need to kind of get to a consensus where it's good for all parties. Mm -hmm. So you kind of work with the whole structure, I think that's important. Yeah, it's very yeah. much like you said, good for all parties. Yeah. We, what we do is we help people see how there is a win-win situation yeah. um, for everyone. And that win-win situation just comes back to, this is why we call it the master key, because once people can see that whatever they're doing, whatever task they're doing at work, whatever relationship is, that is fulfilling their highest priorities, they'll be there. The moment they perceive it's not being fulfilled, they'll be out the job or they'll be um, out the relationship. Yeah, it's a bit difficult, to, you know, critical decision making is difficult mm -hmm. to do, but it's sometimes it's good to help that facilitate. So let's concentrate. We started explaining a lot about all the great things that you do. Let's talk about uh, individually to you. Uh, I'll start off with you. Tell us, um, what, what, why did you go down this route? Because I know that you've been doing this for a while and you are fellow directors. You're all based like on. Uh, you know, it's Different a, 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 a sun, almost on this yeah. wonderful globe, yes. But as, as a, as a, where's the world where's spins? Australia's there, the sun yeah. never sl you know, it's, What's it called? Follow the sun, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Which is the mm. fact that when you go to sleep, you wake up. Yeah, and you carry right. on with the work, and then before yeah, you go to sleep. Meetings are Mamie, can you sleep. sort this out for me? I'm just yeah, going to bed now. So next, you know, <laughs> uh, which is lovely because you cover the, the, whole, the whole world. I think it's called Follow the Sun, actually, yeah. the, the terminology you use in call centres. Yes. No one ever sleeps in call centres. No one ever sleeps, yeah. So. I mean, you've been doing it for a few years, you're both directors, you've been doing it for a few years. What, what's the thing that was, I mean, what was the thing that inspired you to kind of get involved in it more full time and do it, you know? Yeah, um, I mean, I became a coach um, about 2012, but I've been studying human behavior purely for myself um, from nearly now, coming up to 10 years. And that's just because I had my own you know, emotional issues happening and I just wanted to understand, you know, what, how do I manage emotions? How do I actually deal with this thing that we call life? Um, you know, and I was just basically very much into um, positive thinking at the time and negative stuff was still happening to me. Um, and I was just trying to go after this one-sided life that very much nearly put me into depression. So I just wanted to find out how to really manage this. And I, um, we, you know, I went away and started studying it. I went and did a few courses, um, learned how to neutralize my emotions. And on one of those courses, I met Helen. And um, Helen and I had a very similar vision, which is why both of it's really interesting. She's from Australia, I'm from the UK, but we met in the States. Oh, wow. So, okay. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> we'll yeah. do, do a conference over there, shall we? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we just uh, came together because we had a very inspired vision to help people understand, um, you know, how do you actually neutralize these emotions and, um, you know, not try and chase this one sided life. Because um, I can I say now um, what this kind of happy life I was chasing. I live a more fulfilled life now, knowing that I've got both sides of this magnet, both sides of the uh, coin happening with my life. Do, do you think that um, as the world becomes, they call it the attention economy, it's a thing I, I read about a few years ago, which is like, you know, here's my WhatsApp, you know, here's my Instagram, here's my uh, Snapchat, you know, it's a very kind of attention economy, you watch the programs when you want to watch them on, you know, kind of nine episodes later. My God, I've mm. been watching TV for 18 hours. What's going on? <laughs> you know, you know, the, the attention economy is it's so competitive. Do you, is, do you find that's now, is that something that help, is, is helping to drive where people are coming to you more for help because they're just having a, you know, to slow down a little bit, just think about what you're doing. I mean, is that something that you're finding or, you know, in, your, in the last few years that you've been doing stuff or are there other motivations for why you still keep doing what you're doing? I know I've recently said that, why does a builder keep building a house? What's mm -hmm. the deal with it? Does he like the bricks or does he like, or does she like, you know, the lovely design that they can do? What mm -hmm. drives you to do that every day, you know? I think what drives um, or inspires me to do this work every day is seeing the difference it makes in people's lives to help them become self-leaders and self-governors and get out of that victim mentality. Um, Mammy and I, you know, daily work with people and you just see the shifts. And we did workshops last weekend and it was so inspiring for us to actually see what it meant to them with relationships, um, work relationships and personal relationships. Oh. That Do you see that transformation happening and that's something you get joy from? Yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. But they just regain their power is mm -hmm. how I would see it. Um, not to be cocky, but just to actually like be um, empowered to go after what they want in their life and yeah. get more clarity around that. Mm. I think a lot of people, uh, there's a great quote that says, um, people spend more time deciding what car they want and researching it than they do planning their own life. That's a good point. Oh, so yeah. we actually like try to, you know, hold them still for long enough to actually let's do some planning and mm. let's actually have a look at some de developing some um, human behavior type skills that we just weren't taught in schools. 
Uh, they, because they, the sciences weren't available back when I went through school, and even today they're not teaching it in school. I was going to say, just as you said it, I mean, I, I think you, you mentioned that you had an educational background, but I, mm. I think even today the kind of commercial skills, the behavioural skills, the, the working with other people skills, they seem to learn how to become bullies pretty quickly. That's pretty good, you know, kind of isolated clickiness and all that seems to come naturally to some kids but not the stuff which is, what can we do to work together? And I, and I, I did some work for the Interfaith Youth Trust. I was a, 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 um, a chair for a, for a few years. And I remember that if you got a bunch of people from all different backgrounds, all different religions, you know, colours, creeds, whatever, they just forget their differences. They concentrate on a single goal. You know? And I think that's a really good thing for you, inspiring. You said it exactly there. It's the why. And the same in Parliament. Like, if we went to war, I guarantee those guys would all bond together. Yeah. So it's when, when we've got a, a big enough why external to the group, the group will bond. Absolutely. If, they haven't, if they've lost sight of the vision, they'll, that's when conflict can happen. Well, we've actually run out of time. Oh, actually. <laughs> but uh, I'd like to say thanks so much, Helen. Thanks so yeah. much, Mamit, for coming on the show. Really Our appreciate pleasure. it very much. It Thank was uh, really uh, inspiring for me to learn about all the different techniques that you're using and how you're changing lives and for the better. Uh, and all across the world, as we've been. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. All right. Well, Thank I have you a very much back, for and we'll look forward to seeing you again when you come back and maybe talk about uh, some more uh, case, case studies would be really good. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, well, that's the end of the show. We'd really like to thank our guests for coming on, and uh, we really appreciate their time. And uh, we wish uh, Helen all the best as she gets on the plane for 21 hours, <laughs> and we meet when she gets in the car and goes around the corner for half an hour. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Why good you go, Kaza? Why good you go, Father?